All right, we are going to be going over this armamentarium PowerPoint. There are three main components that we need for our armamentarium, our breech loading aspirating syringe, our disposable hypodermic needle, and our anesthetic cartridge. The most common type of syringe that we're going to use is a non-disposable breech loading metallic cartridge type aspirating syringe. I happen to have two of them in my home office. Um, this aspirating syringe is no wings or winged. So with these little wings to help you hang on. Um, Here's our needle adapter, our syringe barrel where our local anesthetic cartridge goes, our finger rest, we either have winged or no wings, and in the picture is a no winged. And then we've got our harpoon. Our harpoon is kind of a sharp pointed metal harpoon that is going to engage in the end of the rubber stopper. Our piston is going to push that harpoon back and forth. And then we have our thumb ring. We want to make sure that we have this thumb ring attached well. It twists on and off. So we want to make sure that that is on so that we don't get into an injection area and then go to aspirate and then have that come off. So then we would have to take everything out and start over again. Um, this hub and syringe adapter it can, the needle can have a plastic or metal that would twist on to here. Plastic or metal hub that would twist on. And then our harpoon is going to go into the rubber stopper. Advantages of these kind of syringes are there's a visible cartridge. You can aspirate with one hand. An aspiration or aspiration tests are accomplished by pulling back on that thumb ring. So here's our thumb ring, pulling back on the thumb ring. It creates a negative pressure. And that's what aspiration is, is a negative pressure. We would get into the area where we're going to inject. Once we felt like we were in the right place, we would pull back on the thumb ring. A negative pressure would be created. If we were near a blood vessel or in the pterygoid plexus area, say we're doing a PSA and we were in the pterygoid plexus area or near a blood vessel, we would see just like a lava lamp, we would see um, a little trickle of blood or sometimes a big trickle of blood that would come into the syringe. If you got a positive aspiration, you would remove yourself, remove the needle and you would change everything and then you would start over. These are autoclavable rust resistant and they're long lasting. They're metal and they're a little heavy. They're a little heavy, a little large for small hands. Dr. Nancy has smaller hands than I am and we both like these winged version, gives you a little more to hold on to. But when you're first learning injection techniques for some with small hands, this can be a little cumbersome and a little heavy. There are other different kinds of syringes available. We've got breech loading plastic cartridge type aspirating syringe. Remember aspirating means you have to make the aspiration. You pull back on this piston and you pull back creating that negative pressure. <clears throat> and if there is a negative aspiration, no blood in the cartridge, great. Negative aspiration, negative aspiration. You're aspirating three times for our PSA and three times for the inferior alveolar or the IA because those are the two most common places where there would be a positive aspiration. So there are breech loading metallic cartridge type that are self aspirating. So as you're pushing, it's doing a little pulsation almost where it's aspirating itself as you're injecting. Then you've got pressure for a periodontal ligament injection, periodontal ligajet, and then disposable. Disposable can require both hands for aspiration. <clears throat> this is a picture of a periodontal ligament syringe. This injection, periodontal ligament injection, is done right into the periodontal ligament that holds the tooth into place. 
Um, if you have to give a periodontal ligament injection, this is the only injection that could possibly require a premedication or an antibiotic prophylactic. That would be depending on if the patient needed that in the first place um, for the procedure that was going to be done. If they fell under our list of patients that had reasons why they would need premedication, they would have to premedicate for this periodontal ligament injection. The needles that we are using are made of stainless steel and the needle gauge actually refers to the size of the lumen. They're available in long or short depending on the injection type and they shouldn't be bent. They should not be forced against resistance. They should be changed after every three or four insertions. Three or four penetrations into tissue and a needle can become dull and a patient could potentially feel that injection more. Um, needles are going to be long or short depending on where we're injecting. If we have a lot of tissue that we need to penetrate, we're going to need a um, longer needle to penetrate that tissue. We should never bend a needle. That is one of the causes of breakage is the needles being bent. Um, if we're to be going in one direction and change it, very suddenly, that could be another reason why needles could potentially break. If we forced the needle, if we're fighting some resistance and we force it, then um, that could be another cause of needle breakage. Inserting to the hub, so in this picture, you can see where the needle goes and attaches to the, um, the, the needle hub. That is the weakest point of the needle. So if we've got the needle all the way injected, then that is a, point where breakage could occur. And using a 30 gauge needle is, that's a small needle, a small lumen sized needle. The smaller the number, the larger the diameter of the lumen. So a 30 gauge needle is very thin, very small around. And that potentially has a higher chance of breakage. In fact, Malamed, who is one of the gurus of local anesthesia and processes, says that you should never use a 30 gauge or an ultra, sh ultra short needle because those are um, more apt for break breakage, more likely to, to have needle breakage. 30 gauge needle has a smaller internal diameter than the 25 gauge. They say that the patients can't tell the difference between the 30 gauge, the 25 gauge, and the 27 gauge. We use a 25 gauge needle for our long needles in the clinic, and we use a 27 gauge for our short needles in the clinic. The advantage of us using those slightly larger needles, the 25 and the 27 gauge, compared to the 30 gauge, are that there's less deflection, so when we go in through the tissue, we're not going in and being pushed around. We're going right to the area where we wanna make the injection. There's greater accuracy. There's gonna be less chance for breakage. And we're more successful with that positive aspiration that when we create the negative pressure that we would potentially have any blood that was in the area go into the needle. We don't want to aspirate and not have enough negative pressure to pull any um, of, the of the blood into the needle where we would have a false negative, we would inject and we would in fact be in a blood vessel, which could create problems, which we'll talk about later on. Longer needles are going to be used when penetrating thicker tissue. And the choice of the needle is the reason why we, we would choose a needle is based on how much tissue we have to penetrate. Long needles are going to be recommended for techniques that require penetration of thicker tissue, such as the inferior alveolar nerve. Shorter needles are going to rec be recommended for any infiltration techniques, for our mental block, for our PSA, for our MSA, ASA, for our greater palatine and nasopalatine blocks. If we're going in the MSA area and we're going at the height of the mucobuccal fold, 
and we're going three to five millimeters into that thin tissue and injecting our site of deposition is at the apex of the second premolar. We don't have very far to go in that area, so a short needle will work great. If we're doing an inferior alveolar injection where we're coming across from our contralateral premolar, and we've got this, this cheeky area to penetrate through, we need a larger, longer needle that's not going to be deflected going through that thicker, cheek, cheekier um, person. We don't want any deflection, and we're gonna be a lot more accurate if we have a larger, longer needle. And patients can't tell the difference anyway. Short needles are approximately one inch or 25 millimeters and long needles are gonna be closer to 40 millimeters. There are bevels on the very end of the needle. There are bevels. We always want the bevel towards the bone. That way, the anesthetic solution is directed towards the bone. So bevel to bone. The cartridge, there is the glass cylinder. The cylinder itself is full of local anesthetic local anesthetic drug and there's the diaphragm so if we look at this picture on your let's see it would be my right hand side so your right hand side we've got our rubber stopper and that's where the harpoon engages and then on the other end we have the diaphragm and the aluminum cap that's where the needle end will insert into that um, cartridge they should always be kept in original containers and warmers are not needed or recommended. Um, there used to be a train of thought where you'd put the anesthetic solution into a warmer and then it would be closer to the temperature of the actual patient so the patient would feel it less. But it's been known to cause burning on injection if that anesthetic solution is warmed. So no warmers. Problems with cartridges. There typically is a very small bubble in the cartridge. So very small bubble or no bubble, that's normal. Um, the bubble is made of nitrogen. It is not nitrous oxide. I ask this as a quiz question somewhere down the line and it's a true and false question. And even though I tell you guys now and I tell you guys in class that it is a nitrogen bubble, not nitrous, often students still get this question wrong. If a large bubble is present, it could be the result of freezing somewhere along the way and that cartridge should be discarded. If there's an extruded stopper, so the stopper's bulging out or pushed out, it could be the result of freezing and that should be discarded. If our aluminum cap is rusted at all, that should be discarded. And if it's a broken cartridge, you'll get a broken cartridge, maybe during shipping, you know, it got dropped or something got, you know, set on top of it, or if there was excessive force to engage that harpoon into the rubber stopper, um, that could cause breaking. If you hit the back of it, sometimes that can cause breaking of the cartridge. Obviously, we wouldn't use those cartridges. If we had an extruded stopper, so the stopper was kind of bulged out, but there was no bubble or the bubble was still really small, it could be that that anesthetic got put in disinfectant. You only put on your tray what you're going to use for that patient. So you don't have three or four cartridges sitting on your tray because they would all be contaminated. And I've seen it before where those contaminated cartridges are put in disinfectant. Okay, great, it kills all of the bacteria potentially that was on the cartridge, but then this stopper kind of bulges out because it was put in disinfectant and then we can't use it anyways. Small, insignificant bubbles, no bubbles, that's fine. Anything else, there's a reason. And I know you guys have some quiz questions on these. Large bubble, extruded stopper, could have been frozen, need to be discarded. Extruded stopper without a bubble, it could have been put in disinfecting solution. Antiseptics, so if we were to go in and we were to give blood or get the flu shot, typically they'll put some betadine on that area just to wipe off any surface bacteria. And that just helps reduce the bacteria at the site. 
we are going to wipe topical wipe, WTW, as Dr. Nancy likes to put it, WTW, wipe topical wipe. We're gonna wipe off with gauze, we're gonna place our topical for one minute, and then we're gonna wipe off with gauze again. Uh, it's not recommended to use any antiseptics that are tinctures because they contain alcohol. That can also cause a burning on injection for a patient. Our topical. I see some students come out with their little cotton sift applicator with just gobs of anesthetic. We do not want gobs of anesthetic. More is not better. You want a small amount. You want to use it sparingly in the site of the injection for one minute prior to um, the actual needle injection penetration. It provides about two to three millimeters of anesthesia. We're not going to rub it because that can cause tissue sloughing. Um, another word for tissue sloughing is epithelial desquamination. If you apply topical too long, it can cause sloughing or epithelial desquamination. Sparingly, I don't want to see big gobs of topical coming out of the sterilizing room. We're going to use a cotton tipped applicator. We're going to use this cotton tipped applicator with topical anesthesia on it at the site of injection. We're gonna have one that does not have topical on it on our tray so that we can kind of picture our pathway into the areas where we're going to inject, the angle that we're going to inject at. We're gonna use it for feeling back in the back near the pterygoid mandibular raphe and for the pterygoid mandibular depression. We wanna make sure that we're feeling, you know, to see if the internal oblique ridge is in the way. So we're gonna be using it for um, just kind of checking the area out before injection. And also, when we are doing the greater palatine and the nasopalatine injection, we use pressure anesthesia with that cotton tipped applicator. So if we're doing the nasopalatine, we've got the incisive foramen covered by the incisive papilla in the anterior portion of our hard palate. We are going to wipe with cotton gauze, we're going to place the topical for one minute. We're going to wipe again. Then we are going to take our cotton tipped applicator with no topical, put it in that area with pressure, lots of pressure for one minute. So you'll see some blanching in those two areas, the greater palatine and the nasopalatine area, because we're putting so much pressure on there. And we're going to keep the pressure in those areas as we're giving the injection. We're going to kind of move it just slightly off of our injection site, and then we're going to give the injection. And the idea would be that because of this pressure, the patient then wouldn't feel the anesthesia or the actual needle poke. We're not going to use the word poke either. <laughs> we're going to use good words. Um, cotton gauze is used just to rid the area of surface bacteria. Hemostats or cotton pliers are going to be in your needle setup. These are going to be used only if there is a broken needle. So if you put in, a, went to go do the injection and maybe you went to the hub or the patient moved and the needle broke, you would want them to stay open and you would grab the hemostats or the cotton pliers and you would be able to retrieve that broken needle if necessary. Remember we said that bending the needle, we're never ever ever gonna bend the needle you may see some dentists in clinic do that. We do not do that. They've been doing it for years and years and it's worked for them, but we are not going to do that. No bending the needle, no sudden direction changes, no forcing the needle against resistance, no inserting to the hub, and we're not going to use the smaller diameter, larger number like the 30 gauge. Then we're going to be less likely to have any needle breakage. When we actually assemble the syringe, we're going to insert the cartridge first. Cartridge first, star, star, star. Cartridge first, we're gonna pull back on the piston to get that harpoon out of the way. Once we get the cartridge in, barcode facing away from us, we're gonna engage and push in and engage that harpoon into the rubber stopper. Then we're gonna attach the needle. We have recapping devices. There is no recapping of needles. 
no recapping of needles. We have these recapping devices. We are never even going to touch on either side like this. We're always going to have our hand out here on the needle cap. The needle's going to come in from this way. Needle cap will be, will be contained within this recapping device. We're going to remove the cap. We're going to expel a few drops. As you're expelling a few drops, do not wipe that tip onto anything. You know, it's your first instinct if there's dripping to kind of wipe it on some gauze or catch those drops. We want to maintain as much sterility as we can. I drip kind of on my way in and I'll rinse the patient out when I'm done. Don't worry about the drips. Don't wipe it on anything else. After you're done giving the injection, we're going to recap. We would have our hand on this side. We would recap, set it aside. When we're totally done with the procedure, we will take our hand, twist the needle off, put it into our sharps container, push it through. This gets thrown away. And then the actual local anesthetic cartridge is put into the black box in the sterilizing lab. So we've got that black box right when you walk in on the left-hand side. Our cartridges go in there, and then the needle goes into the sharps containers that are placed around the clinic. There's one near almost every chair. So into the red sharps container. Here's our needle recapping devices, and we use those exact cards. You can see how the cap of the needle is in there. And once we're done, that needle recapping device stays. We set it aside in case we would need another injection. Here's our sharps containers and they're in locked bins around the clinic, located around the clinic. And let me make sure I got everything for you guys. Um, pain on insertion of the entry of the injection is usually caused by a dull needle. So remember three or four times is the max amount of times that you would want to use the needle for injection purposes. If there is pain on withdrawing of that needle, it could be that there was a barb that was um, there during the manufacturing process. Or it could have been that if you were doing the IA injection and you injected and you hit bone, it could have bent the little tip up. And then there would be pain on, not on injection, but on withdrawal. So pain on injection is usually because of a dull needle. And on withdrawal is because of a barb on the end. So that little end is just bent just slightly. So it kind of drags on its way out. And that could be because of manufacturing or if you hit bone. All right. That's it. Great job, guys. Great job.